My name is Al. If I've not had a chance to meet you, I'm the pastor, uh, the lead pastor of the church here, and I hope I get a chance to say hello to you, to introduce myself, and get to know about you today. Uh, if you are a first-time guest, we're so glad that today is the day that you came to be with us. It's never a bad time to, to greet new people, and we always pray that God is going to send uh, newcomers our way. God has tremendously blessed us since we've been in this, uh, in this new location. We're, we're seeing new faces all the time, and, and that is a true gift that we do not take lightly. Uh, and for our first-time guest, I ask a special favor. We're not going to single you out or make you stand up and sing the visitor song or anything like that. Uh, we just want you to to, to do us a favor, inside of your connect, uh, inside of your worship folder is a connect card. We just like to have a record of your attendance today. And if you would take a few moments and fill it out with as much information as you want to to give us, uh, and hold on to it at the end of uh, for the end of the service, and then you can take it to our connecting point desk which is out in the lobby, we will give you a $5 Starbucks gift card uh, just as our incentive for you to fill that out. We'd love for you to, to let us know uh, about you. And so please do that today as we, uh, as we continue. I also want to say good morning to our viewers on Facebook Live. Our uh, fi Facebook Live stream uh, is actually uh, popular with people who can't be here on Sunday mornings who are traveling uh, or just kind of enjoy the ability to stay at home and uh, watch church on television uh, or on their, on their device, I should say. So I hope that one day you'll join us in person and that you won't just uh, settle for the experience of watching, you know, but actually being here and participating. So thank you, Facebook family, for watching. But today uh, we, we have some uh, somber things that we want to talk about at the beginning. Um, first of all, many of you know the Ironman triathlon is going on in Delaware. We just got news this morning around 930 that one of the bicyclists was struck and killed uh, on 23, and so that is uh, just not what we want to hear, and so we don't know a lot of details. We just want to pray for that family, um, and certainly the family of the person who's deceased and the family of the person who hit uh, the, the person uh, on the bike. Uh, so we're going to pray for them in a moment, and we also have been uh, asked to pray for a family in our church, uh, and the details are, you know, God knows them best, but just let's just pray today for a, a girl named Renee who is struggling with some strongholds in her life, and uh, she, she made some tough decisions to try to, to end her life, uh, and so we just want to pray for her as she's recovering right now in Children's Hospital. Uh, Renee is a, a member of our church, her family is, and so we just want to pray for them right now. So would you join me in this pastoral prayer? Father, um, there's no problem that is too big for you. There's no issue or, uh, pr uh, or, or situation that arises that catches you by surprise. Lord, you know it all. And Lord, I pray for uh, the peace and comfort that only you can give to this family that has to be grieving right now and, and totally numb, maybe even in shock over the fact that their loved one has, has lost their lives. Lord, we don't know anything beyond that, but we just pray, God, that in your infinite wisdom and your power and your glory that you would send the people uh, into that situation that need to be there today and minister to this family and to help them to, to deal with this initial shock of everything that's going on. Lord, I pray for safety for the rest of the participants, God, that it would not, um, nothing else like this would happen. And Lord, we just, we, we are so at a loss for, for even what to say, but Lord, we give it to you. And Lord, we also want to pray for Renee right now. Uh, Lord, Renee is dearly loved by her mom and dad. She is dearly loved by her siblings. She's dearly loved by her church. And God, I pray that, that Satan would leave her alone. I pray that in the powerful name of Jesus, God, that the stronghold of addiction and the, the need for approval and acceptance, God, that will be found only in you, and Lord, we know that there are processes and systems and uh, programs and doctors that can take care of this, God. But we pray that through your power that you would release her from this bondage. Lord, release her from what is holding her back. Lord, we agree in prayer that you can do it and that you have the power, Lord, to make that happen. And so, God, I pray that today uh, you, would, you would bring healing to her, God. Let that begin now. Lord, I pray that she would see that life is worth living, and Lord, that you are the one who can, who can give her meaning. And God, I pray for her parents, Lord, as they are struggling and they're, they're just walking on eggshells, Lord, not knowing from one moment to the next what might happen. God, help them to, to make the tough decisions and to be courageous and confident in it and give them support, Lord, through our church family and through their uh, extended family as well. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
All right, so I want to begin this morning by inviting you to take your uh, insert. Uh, on the back of that, we have, a, uh, we have an outline. If you want to take notes about uh, the, the message today, I'd encourage you to do that. We're going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 38 through 48, and I'm going to go ahead and read that at the outset today. And as I read the Word of God, I, I've prayed today that just like windows give illumination uh, and bring in light into this beautiful space that we have, that God is going to bring light into your life today, into your heart, to open your eyes to the power of the scriptures, to open your eyes to the power of what God can do through his word. And so we'll begin reading at chapter 5, verse 38. You've heard that it was said, and this is Jesus talking, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, Hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Today we're talking about a difficult subject, a hard teaching of Jesus, and that is the teaching that calls upon us to love our enemies, to love the people who persecute us, who criticize us, who curse us, who hate us. And maybe today you've got someone in mind. Maybe uh, you can identify with the very popular pop star right now, Taylor Swift. Tay Swift just released a new song this past week called The Archer. And in the song, she basically is talking about the problems that she's had over the years with trusting people, uh, with all of the high-profile, highly publicized relationships she's been in, and all of the feuds that she's had with different celebrities. It's left her with this, this being gun shy about trusting people and being vulnerable and kind of opening up her heart to these things. And that's what the song is all about. And, and, and I, I was struck by one of the lyrics that uh, is going to appear up on the screen. And maybe you can identify with this. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put me together again because all of my enemies started out friends. And maybe today that's exactly kind of where you find yourself. You are, you are, dealing, you are, you are dealing with the frustration and the angst felt by the fact that, that you have enemies who mean you harm or who, who, do, who are not nice to you or don't treat you well. Or you have, even worse, you have people in your heart that you have hatred for, that you're harboring resentment and you want to get vengeance on them. And you find it difficult to trust people in your circle today. So who comes to your mind this morning, and you don't have to say it out loud, I, I prefer you not, uh, who comes to your mind that you would identify as your enemy Think of the one person or family or group of people in the world that, that you just don't like, that, that you could really do without ever seeing again. Think about your ultimate enemy at this moment in your life. But you say, wait a minute, pastor, I'm a Christian. I don't hate anybody. All right, good for you, man. That's, that's awesome. Good for you. If you don't hate anybody, I'll give you a second choice. Think of the person that you love the least. Well, pastor, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to love everybody, right? Okay, great. Well, how about number three then? Think of the person that you like the least. Like the person that you can tolerate just the least. You you have to answer that one, okay? Let's just play along. Or if you can't answer that one, who is the person or group that you fear the most? Like, where are you today? And the point is, I want you to visualize in your mind's eye the the person that you would consider to be your enemy, the person who does not mean you well, the person who has not done you well. Think of the one person that you would see as your enemy. Now, I would imagine that in in, in a group uh, like this, there there are probably a uh, variation of differences, a variation of answers. Maybe it's your parents that you're feuding with right now and you're not getting along with them, maybe because uh, they, are, they are not giving you the love and support that you think that you deserve. Um, maybe your parents 
were abusive to you verbally, sexually, emotionally. Uh, maybe they withheld from you, right? Maybe they, they didn't give you the, the support you needed. Or, or maybe your parents lied to you and made you think that you were the most important person in the universe and you found out that this world is cruel, so you're kind of blaming them on them. Uh, maybe it's an ungrateful and rebellious child that you feel like is your enemy. A child into whom you poured everything you had, your love, your money, your time, and now... They are abandoning you and maligning your name or rebelling against you. Um, and, and maybe that's your enemy. Maybe your enemy today is a spouse who's cheating on you and you know it. Maybe uh, your enemy is your spouse who left you for somebody else. Maybe your enemy is a friend who you once trusted, you once confided in, and now they betrayed you and they've gossiped about you. And at every opportunity, they've tried to tear you down. Maybe that's not where you are today. Maybe some of you are, are thinking about your political enemies. Like, you know, in, in this contentious political climate that we live in today, like you, you've hidden certain people on social media because you disagree with 99% of everything they say on Facebook when it comes to political things. You don't agree with them on abortion, ab on race, on immigration, on whatever it is. You just don't agree, and you consider them to be your enemy. Uh, you, you find enemies when it comes to your views on life and death and abortion and war. Uh, maybe your enemies are theological enemies. Now that seems, seems kind of weird, but you know, maybe there are people who go to a certain church that, that you think, you know what, they're not preaching the truth or, or they're watering it down or you know, whatever it is, you think that they're your enemies. And so we have to think about all of these people and get them in our mind's eye. And so the passage I just read to you earlier addresses all of us is what I want you to see. And it's been said before that like that passage summarizes Christian ethics, all of it together. And so we come to this very difficult teaching to love your enemy. How do you love your enemy? How do you pray for those who persecute you? How do you, how do you go about doing that? How does that even happen? I'd say there's a good chance that you've heard these phrases before, and maybe you didn't know where they came from, and now you do. But the question is, even though they were spoken 2,000 years ago, how do you apply them today into your situation? You see, what's important to understand is that whenever you come across a teaching of Jesus that seems illogical, absurd, difficult, impossible, maybe even, uh, you need to understand that he didn't say those things to make you cringe because he slipped up or because he made a mistake or because he's trying to be a shock jock or because he's trying to be mean. Jesus said those things because he genuinely wants transformation in our hearts. He cares about you. He cares about your development and your growth. He wants you to grow. He wants to see transformation take place in your life. And so that often happens through challenges. Transformation will often happen in your life when you're going through difficult times. Pressure produces diamonds. Friction often produces spiritual growth in the life of the follower of God. So you'll see that and you're like, well, I, I'm not really sure if I believe that I can do that. So when Jesus says these things that are difficult to hear, it's for a redemptive purpose. It's to bring us back closer to him and remind us of how dependent we are on him. So he's not afraid to offend you. He's not afraid to offend me or challenge me. And that makes all the difference. You see, we often read what Jesus said and our tendency, our temptation is to say, well, he couldn't have possibly meant that literally. That was spoken all these years ago. There was a different context. Certainly it doesn't apply to me, not to my situation. And in essence, what we do is we strip the passage of its meaning. We strip the words of Jesus down and we say, well, okay, uh, it doesn't apply to me today. So maybe today you're thinking about your enemy and you're thinking, you know what, I can identify with that. I, I believe that I've, I've done that before. How do we respond in a way that pleases Jesus? How do we present a credible witness to our face? How do we reach an unbelieving world that is just waiting for an opportunity to tear us down when it comes to our faith. So how do we do that? So today we're going to talk about loving your enemies. And you know, loving your enemies is actually clear all throughout the New Testament. You can see it all over the place in the, in the Bible. In the fulfillment of God's gracious plan for our lives through Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit, we are called upon to love our enemies enemies. Over and over and over and over again, it says, love your enemies. 
Now, I want to talk uh, about just very briefly today about some things that I think this passage is saying to us and then how we're going to take it out of here today, not just hear the word, but actually do the word. So the first thing I would point out, when Jesus is, is saying this and it seems difficult, you need to understand there's, there's a, a critical distinction to make. Loving and liking are two different concepts. Loving and liking are two different concepts. You can love someone, but not like what they do. And the word love in this passage is the, is the word agape, which basically means a, a God-based love that is a benevolent love for every single person, but you don't have to like what they do. The Bible never says, nor does Jesus ever say, like your enemies, because he knows that we can't do that. You know, oftentimes there are just, there's just people that, you know, you, you meet maybe at school, at work, on a retreat, maybe even at church, which is why we have two different, you know, sections. We let, you know, some people sit here and some people sit there. And uh, the command, though, it isn't to like your enemies. The, the command is love your enemies. And maybe there are people that you just know that you don't click with. You're at a party with them. You're at an event. And you just are like, you know what? If I had to live with that person, I would put my head through a plate glass window. You know, that's what you say. You're like, I can't do it. But love is a decision. It's an act. And Jesus says, Anybody can choose to love anyone, anyone at all, because love means you, you want that person's well-being to be at the forefront. Even though it may not come from your hand, you're saying, you know what, I just want to live at peace. I don't want to be at war. You see, there's no scripture that ever commands you and says it's okay to hate your enemies. So when Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and then hate your enemy. He, he knows that it was never in the scriptures. He's saying, this is what our culture is telling you to do. This is what the world in which you live is modeling for you. That's why we love movies like Rambo and Terminator and John Wick and most of the Carrie Underwood songs, which, by the way, are written about revenge, taking revenge on guys, if you didn't figure that out. But that's exactly what we, we are conditioned to believe that, you know what, that's exactly what we should do. We should take, we should get our pound of flesh. We should give a person what they're giving back to us. But you see, Jesus is saying, no, you can't do that. So you don't have to like a person, but we are called upon to love them. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. The second thing I will tell you that, uh, is this, loving enemies means to resist hatred. That's what he's getting at. Loving your enemies means that you resist having a hatred for them. Now, can you imagine reading Matthew 5 if you were an African American growing up in the South or even really in the United States in the 1950s or the 60s? Can you imagine that? How would you hear this? How would you interpret that? How would you even apply it? What about if you were a Jew who was living in Europe in the late 30s and early 40s? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. How do you do that? The problem with Jesus' teaching both here and throughout the Sermon on the Mount is that we don't think it fits our experiences in the world. I mean, let's just be honest. We think that, you know, we come for once a week uh, at church for an hour and 15 minutes. We get about a 30 or 35 minute message and we think that's all that we need. But really the Word of God does not apply after Sunday. It doesn't apply to my life experience. It doesn't apply to my word. But I hope to convince you and change your mind of that because I know that many of you experience hatred, violence, injustice, persecution, and then you come to the words of Jesus on Sunday morning, and it sounds like impossibility. It sounds like pie in the sky. What do you mean turn the other cheek? How could I do good to those who mean harm to me? How can I give them my shirt when they've already stolen my coat? How do I pray for those people who persecute me? And maybe even in, if you've grown up in the church your whole life and you've been taught these verses, if you've memorized them, the fact of the matter is when you came up against some type of evil or danger or threat in the world, a lot of times it was very difficult to apply those words. And they probably got thrown out the window on, a, uh, on occasion. And guess what? You're like everybody else in this room. It's easy to love those who love you, but Jesus says it's going to be more difficult to love people who persecute you and to pray for them. So what we often do when we approach the Sermon on the Mount, especially when he talks about vengeance, we think, you know what? This doesn't work when I'm facing bullies. This doesn't work when I'm facing problems. And these Bible verses disappear. And so we're left to face on our own and with our, on our own devices the, the threats that are happening in our world. You know, we live in a world where it seems like justice is always delayed. 
We live in a world where, where it always seems as if goodness is hidden under the shadow of evil and where hatred is stronger than love. It always seems like we're on the losing team. But let's remember, we have the home field advantage. That we are not on the losing team. That we are not the underdogs. And so when we take this experience, we, we need to, we need to, when we come to a teaching like this, we have two options. Number one, we say it's absurd, it's ridiculous, it's impossible, and I'm not going to follow it. Or we will say, you know what, I need to re- re- reevaluate what I think about this world. Those are the two options because there, there are no other options. We either say, Jesus, you're absurd, it's impossible, I can't do it, or we say, I need to change the way I think. And so when was the last time that you changed your mind about something that you had deeply held? Hopefully it's when you've come in contact with the Word of God. So Jesus is saying, walk the second mile, turn the other cheek, give your tunic and cloak. He's saying, not necessarily saying, if you, do, if you don't do these things all the time, you're a bad follower. He says, you do these when your heart is set free from anger and hatred and revenge, when vengeance has not taken a bitter root in your heart, when you've been completely rehabilitated. That's when he says that you know that you're doing these things, and after a while you want to do it. Because you know that if I, if I reserve and I hold on to bitterness, it's only going to kill me on the inside. It's only going to make me a bitter person and not very pleasant to be around. You'll love others so much that you will want what is truly good for them. You will want to walk the second mile and turn the other cheek and give, those, give of those who ask of you. So Jesus is saying, this is what a rehabilitated heart looks like. And I love what the Apostle Paul, who, whose heart was changed by Jesus, by the way, I love what he had to say about it in his letter to the Romans. He says this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And now remember, if it is possible, As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So how do we change the way we view the world? We change by seeing the world the way Jesus does. Because when we look out, we see, oh, everything in the world is is full of injustice and anger and hatred and violence. But Jesus said, no, no, no. I see a world in which my Father is in control. I see a world in which justice delayed is not justice denied. In fact, justice is guaranteed one day. Jesus said, I see a world that, that is just only temporary and that one day we're all going to be together in eternity. And when you and I can see the world through that lens of the gospel, then Jesus tells us, you know what, here's how you can make sense of what's happening in your life. So the issue here is not whether or not we resist evil because we should. But we do it, we overcome evil with good. We're called to be examples of righteousness and justice in the world. So the question is, why do we pursue righteousness and justice? Jesus forbids us to to do that out of anger or hatred or vengeance because we want to get even. We do these things. We pursue righteousness, justice, and goodness because we love God. And because we love others, even the perpetrators of evil. So I don't want you to walk away thinking that this means that you've got to tolerate every bad thing that happens to you. This is not a call to pacifism. Not at all. It means that in everything we seek what is good for the other, not only for ourselves. That we say, I I want you to see the love of God through me. And so if we live the way Jesus lived, if we do the things that he, he says to do in the Sermon on the Mount, people are going to think you're completely out of your mind. They're going to look at you and think, man, you've lost it. Turn the other cheek, go the second mile. The reason we look so crazy to our world is because we see a world that they don't see. We see the things that they can't understand. And we don't wear that as a badge of arrogant honor, but instead we say, I'm going to use this humbly to reach the world. So before I wrap up, I want to make sure you've heard what I've intended you to hear and not what I haven't. In a group this size, no doubt, there are experiences of unbelievable evil and justice. Some of you are struggling with things that I cannot even imagine, and some of you are struggling right now deeply with this thought of, how do I begin to actually put this into practice. How do I show goodness, kindness, and and love to those who harm me or, or who want to harm me or who have harmed me? The last thing in the world I want you to leave here this morning with is feeling a burden that it's all up to you to just try harder. 
Remember, Jesus is not giving us anything new. We've always been told to love our neighbors. His intention is not to burden you with a heavier, stricter interpretation of the Bible because the law is not going to be something that will really rehabilitate your heart anyway. It's the grace of God. So the question I want you to leave here with this morning is not how can I try harder to love people or, or, or why don't I love people the way I should. The question I want you to leave here with is what kind of world do I see? What kind of world do I see when I, when I look out? Do I see a world of evil, danger, and threats? A world in which my life is in constant peril? Or do I see a God-controlled world? A God-with-you world? A God-who's-in-the-fire-with-me world? A world of justice, goodness? And, and do I see a world that eventually, when it ends here, I'm going to step into eternity? Is that what we see? If you're still caught in the spin cycle of the world, and I imagine that, you, that, that there are many of us who are, that, that you know, we receive all around us a fear, threat, and danger all the time. Don't leave here feeling guilty about that. I, I, I encourage you to confess your fears to God right now and, and acknowledge that, that you still want to take vengeance. You still have some hatred that you're harboring in your heart. Be honest with Him and reveal it, and then invite Him to come near. Invite Him to inexplicably, unexplainably, unbelievably, supernaturally draw you near so that he can do the work he wants to do, so that you will experience the reality that God is with you always, even to the very end of the age. I was thinking very, very stringently and just thinking very hard about how can I, how can I find this? And I, and I found a story that I think illustrates how you can forgive those who are your enemies. It happened a few years ago to a lady named Victoria Rivolo. Uh, she was driving to her, voices, uh, to her niece's voice recital uh, on, a, on a highway when she passed another car driven by a 19-year-old boy named Ryan Cushing. Cushing was riding with five other teens, and they had just used a stolen credit card to go on a spending spree, and one of their purchases was a frozen turkey. So instead of taking it back to cook, Ryan decided that he was going to toss that turkey into oncoming traffic. And so that 20-pound turkey became a projectile missile that crashed through the windshield of the car Victoria Rivola was driving and smashed her face. And amazingly, she survived, even after 10 hours of surgery in an operating room while doctors repaired her face. I, did, I wouldn't show you the pictures of when she first went in because we, we wouldn't be able to, to keep our lunch down or our breakfast down. When she finally went home, she brought home a tracheotomy tube and endured months of painful rehabilitation. And yet, shockingly, indescribably, Rivolo was well enough to attend Cushing's sentencing, and she asked his judge to take leniency on him. And part of her statement read, Despite all of the fear and pain, I've learned from this horrific experience, and I have much to be thankful for. Every day I wake up, I thank God simply because I'm alive. I sincerely hope you have also learned from this awful experience, Ryan. There is no room for vengeance in my life, and I do not believe a long, hard prison term would do you, me, or society any good. When Cushing heard her say that, he wept, and he expressed remorse for his actions, and he was sentenced to six months in jail. Now, he could have gotten a 25-year prison sentence if Rivolo had not intervened on his behalf. But listen to what she said. She said, I truly hope that by demonstrating compassion and leniency that I've encouraged you to seek an honorable life. If my generosity will help you mature into a responsible, honest man whose graciousness is a source of pride to your loved ones and your community, then I will be truly gratified and my suffering will not have been in vain. Ryan, prove me right. Now, after this happened, Rivolo, after she recovered, wrote a book. She went on the speaker circuit as an inspirational speaker, uh, speaking on the power of forgiveness. And uh, unfortunately, she died earlier this year in March at age 59. Not sure if it was as a result of her injuries. But I think she died with a clean conscience, not having hatred in her heart, not having that extra baggage of thinking, you know what, here's someone that I never released. I never got rid of the bitterness that I had. And I just said, I'm going to forgive you, even though I have every right to hate you and hate what you've done and the fact that you've changed my life forever. That is an example of what it means, what it means to forgive your enemy. So I want to leave you with three take-homes, three take-homes with you today, and then we'll talk about something very, very important. 
Loving enemies means that we are growing up in the faith. In other words, or you could even say forgiving your enemies means you're growing up in your faith. That means that you're going beyond infancy, spiritual infancy. You're becoming a child of God, a son and daughter who's growing more like him. That's how you know. And that's the goal. Next, loving others creates a climate of blessing. So when you forgive, you are setting the stage for God to, to bring blessing into your life. We deserve punishment. We deserve eternity uh, separated from God. But God says, no, I'm going to give you a second chance and a third chance and, and so on. So when you do that, it becomes easier to win your enemies and make them your friends. And then the third thing is loving others is the best testimony we have. And when you forgive other people, it's the best example of what God is doing in your life. You know that God expects you as a believer to live on a higher plane than the world who returns good for good and evil for evil? Like He expects us not to look like the world and, and those who are lost. He wants us to be different. And the way we do that is, is by, the first step is, is by growing in Him, right? But maybe some of you are, are wondering, how could God ever, ever do that for me? How could God ever expect me to forgive? Well, it's because he's forgiven us. See, I want you to understand that, that in the beginning of time when God created man, you know, he created us, and in, the Bible says that in the beginning was God, and God created us, and so we've all, you know, we, we exist only because of God's mercy and because of God's grace. And I want to show you today what, what this looks like. It, it, this is a very simple illustration that I've seen over the years. It's called the bridge illustration. You see, there... We have God on one side and we have us on the other. God created us and he wants us to be in a relationship with him. Well, the problem is the moment that we sin, the moment that we willingly commit our very first sin, the Bible says that, that it creates this divide between us and God. And it's a divide called a uh, chasm or whatever it is that, that we cannot bridge ourselves. We cannot, even though we try, right? Like we try, but we always fall short. So, you know, we are always trying to be good and, and come to church and say our prayers and, and do good deeds. But all of those things fall short because none of us can be perfect. None of us can be sinless morally. So we all fall short of that. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and that death is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Now, we believe that what the Bible teaches about hell is true, that there is an eternal separation for those who do not, who do not uh, follow God and those who cannot reach God because of their, they think their best efforts are going to save them. But you know, the wonderful thing about the gospel of the good news is that the only way to bridge that chasm was accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. That he was the one who said, I am willing to die on the cross for the sins of everybody and I am willing to erase, to erase the consequences called hell. For everyone who will believe in me and then what do we have to do to receive that? We have to Take that step of faith toward God. We have to, on the basis of the cross and in the grace of God, say yes and say, I want, to, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. I want to be restored. I want to have you, Lord, as the leader and forgiver of my life. And so maybe you've never heard this before and you're wondering, well, you know, how, how do I access this? Well, the first thing the Bible says you need to do is believe. You need to actually believe with your, with your head that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, John 3.16, the most familiar verse in all the Bible, says this, that, that God loved you so much that he gave his one and only Son that if you would just believe in him, you would have eternal life and, and not perish. You believe in him. You believe with your head. And then with your heart, the Bible says, you repent. That means that you turn away from your sins, you forsake those, you ask for forgiveness of those sins, you turn away from them, and you turn to God. That's what repentance looks like. Uh, Acts 3 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The Lord refreshes you when you turn away from your sin and you turn to Him. And then, you know, in the book of Acts, when every person accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you know what they did? They didn't just go home and go on their merry way. The Bible never says that they prayed a prayer of salvation. It says that they, they repented and then they were baptized. They were baptized into Jesus. They, they had their, their sins washed away, not by their, their own efforts, but all of their sins were washed away. And instead of going to, in the illustration of, you know, Sam Houston, they didn't go to the fish they went to Jesus. They went on him on the cross. And our sins are, are washed away. And so today, maybe there, there are those of you who have, you know, you've 
receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you were at church and you prayed a prayer to receive Jesus or you were at a crusade or a revival or a conference and, and you received Jesus, but you've never taken the step that, that God asks of you and that is to demonstrate your devotion by going public, by being baptized. And so we, we baptize people any Sunday, any night during the week or day during the week that they want to be baptized. Whenever you want to do it, our baptism was usually set at about 92 degrees. The water is crystal clear. We have towels and t-shirts and everything to take it away any obstacle for you to receive Jesus and go public with your faith. But I also realize that for some people, it's a daunting task to get up in front of people and say, oh, I'm going to do this by myself. Now, some people can, some people will, some people have, but not everybody will do that. So on August the 11th, about three weeks from now, we're going to have an opportunity for you to go public. Uh, it's actually two weeks from now. We're going to have an opportunity for you to go public with your face by being baptized. And so we're going to have an opportunity in both services, our 9 and our 1030, for you to be baptized. Now, I want to invite you, if you're thinking about this decision, we have back at our connecting point desk, uh, as you go into the lobby, we have some cards that look like this. Uh, there are two on this card just because it's the original copy, but uh, we're talking about Baptism Sunday, and you can indicate what your decision is. If you can't be here on the 11th, we can set a time for you to be baptized at another time. If you have questions, you're still not really sure if, if it's right for you, we can talk to you about that as well. But don't let this opportunity slip by you today as you think about what your decision will be for God. And so right now, let's close out. Let's ask God to use this message and, and change us so that our world can be changed. Let's, let's bow together. Father, we believe that you have the power to do anything. We believe, God, that you have the power to forgive even our sins, even the things that we have struggled with, even the things that, that we are ashamed of, and we, we never would believe that you could ever overlook them. But God, we know that you take our sins and you cast them as far as the east is from the west. You bury them, Lord, in the depths of the ocean, and they never come up again, God, except if we bring them up or are in